that. No problem. Yeah, I saw that there are other chapters now. There are, but they're not, they have no content yet. Um, so we can go ahead and talk about that part, I guess, that um, my thought is we'll do kind of a review and a combination of maybe some catch up on what has changed since we read the book, because there are some chapters that have changed a little bit. Um, and then hopefully the week after we're going to get um, Max and or Julia in again, but that's not set in stone yet. Max is on vacation next week. Um, and then we're ahead of the book. And so either we could go do another one. Um, I actually have a couple other clubs that I'm probably going to start. So we might pause this one. I don't know. Um, so that's something to kind of discuss in the channel that we're running what, out of content. What what other book clubs are you starting? So we're going to do, um, was it Practical Statistics for Data Scientists? Um, which does not have an online version, but it is, it just has a second, or it just came out with a second edition that has actual R code in it and it's just stats focused, which is something I'd like to brush up on. And then at some point, there's been a request for tidy text, and I would like to read that one too. So, yeah. That one's a quick one. Yeah. So, um, might do both. We'll see. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I need to. Uh, like you're, you're you're setting them up, or you're being like an active participant in both. Active participant in both. Wow. So I don't know that they'll both start running right away, because I want to be an active participant in both, and mm -hmm. I'm running an R4DS club at work now too. So. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> how how big of a like department of like either data scientists or data engineers do you guys have uh very very small like my my department is now me and one other person um and we have two other data scientists outside of that group and we've got uh two data engineers um yeah nice yeah i was talking to uh a, someone who works at like a competitor and he runs his department of like a hundred data scientists. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's different. <laughs> so. Where do you find your data engineers? Please. We need one so bad. I don't know. Uh, where to find them. I don't know. I, I wasn't involved hiring them. Uh, where did he, Clayton came from? Oh, Austin, you know, a different, different startup company in Austin. Mm. They move around. He's we've had them for a while though, actually. So you got to keep them, I guess, is the important yeah. thing. <laughs> or you just got to start picking up new skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Exciting. We got one more while we were talking, but I think that is probably it. I don't think this one's going to be super long to talk through, uh, but it is fun. I have some questions for the crowd, I think. I didn't write them down, but we'll see. Um, OK, so let's start. Uh, let's see. Here are the learning objectives that John sent to me about two hours ago. <laughs> uh, I did not exactly follow this, but these are good things uh, to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know. By my, I've, I've complained about this before, but my R markdown is very weird. So I might have added some extra formatting. Here. Yeah. Um, I'll take a look when you PR it. No big deal. No, no. Like the way my like knitter works, it oh. like reformats. Like, I don't know. That's... If I if I copy pasted your stuff, I don't, I don't know if, you, if we want to do it now, but I can There are gaps. Thing. That's the only, that's the main thing. That first well, line is kind of weird because it's got the double. Yeah. No, and I didn't add that. I didn't add that. It just like when I save, it like add, it like tries to reformat and like like add spaces or sometimes like we'll reformat this to all be on one line, which mm -hmm. is ugly. Yeah. And I'm like I don't it, like it adds this this like slash right at the end. I'm yeah. like I didn't do that. <laughs> I don't know if it's like just my like R markdown or an editor that's kind of weird like that. 
I don't know. What's that white vertical line? Yeah, this one? That, That's no, like the 80, characters. 80 character limit. So oh. if you look at the style guide, it says like no code should run longer than 80 characters. So they tell you to like indent afterwards. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I don't really follow it, but it's a good guide. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's our learning objectives. I guess uh, we're doing, it's all workflow sets. Uh, so lots of workflow sets. So a little bit of uh, ANOVA tuning, which I actually don't show in these examples, but uh, you can get more practice with it and it was covered in the book. Uh, all right, so here's my obligatory setup. So the, the book uses concrete data set, which I just like. I looked at that and I was like, okay, I can't do this. I gotta, I gotta pull a different data set. So here's my meme for today, me looking at this concrete data set. I was not impressed, okay? So I pulled, I mean, I saw this on Nick Wan's stream. He was using the 2021 World Happiness Report data set, which is pretty small. Like I think it's only like 150 rows or something. Uh, in fact, I printed out here, 149. It's got a, quite a bit of columns. Um, and we're not going to use all of them here, but I think the one to point out here is this ladder score. This is kind of like their score, their ultimate like uh, value that they put on the happiness of a country. And it's you know related to a couple other factors. Of course, some of these we don't want to use. I think these upper whisker and lower whisker are just like, they're, I don't know if they ran some like Bayesian analysis or something. And like, here's our upper bound on ladder score, upper and lower bounds. Um, so those aren't going to be features we're going to use to help predict. Uh, but I figured I'd just do a quick skimmer because we all love skimmer mm -hmm. uh, of all the variables. And so I ended up picking just, I don't know, here's like six of them, I think, plus the ladder score. Um, so it'll make it a lot easier to kind of look through. And did a quick correlation analysis, just looking at how they correlate with ladder score. Um, so a couple, a couple of them are pretty pretty highly correlated and even the negatively correlated ones are pretty highly, or at least this one is generosity for some reason is not uh, highly correlated at all with the ladder score. And just obligatory uh, correlation matrix here. I'm always conflicted about how to do this. Like, do I want to put the labels on the bottom or on the side? I opted for the side, but then took out the labels on the bottom. So it's maybe not so clear. Okay, what does it actually correlate with? I don't know what the best way to do the correlation matrix is. I think they're just like nice to look at. You're just like, oh, pretty colors, and then you move on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that was a, uh, I think that gives us an idea. There are some, there are definitely going to be some things we can, uh, we're going to be able to predict this pretty well, seeing the higher correlation with some of the features with at least the ladder score, but also with each other. So there's gonna, there could be some issues, you know, with uh, correlated variables there. So exploring different model frameworks is going to be non-trivial here, right? We, we want to see uh, which ones are going to stand out. So workflow sets. Uh, this is just some boring setup code for train test splitting. Uh, really, I even use like the same, the same number of repeats here. I didn't do anything different with the initial split. I like to do this sometimes. I don't know if people do this. Like I, I have a column, my target variable. I define in like its own variable, make a symbol out of it. And that way, if I'm like, if I'm like really doing EDA and I'm not even sure what I want to predict, <laughs> like this makes it easier to kind of just uh, change here. So I've got my, you know, call uh, my symbol version of, uh, of my Y column. And that comes into play later, like here with the strata variable. And I think even with, I mean, like the formula, I don't have to like rewrite the formula. I mean, I guess you could always control find in your document and uh, everything would change, but I don't know. I like to do it. It's maybe a little Pythonic, honestly, where you like, oh, define your Y variable as a, uh, your, your uh, response variable and its own variable. Um, anyway, it's just something I like to do. Uh, so we're gonna start here with uh, two recipes. Uh, one where we just kind of normalize all the variables and then one where we build on that and add uh, polynomial terms, uh, basically uh, just second order terms, or also interacting a bunch of the, those terms. So that, that can potentially be a large formula. And this is a huge benefit of using recipes, right? Who wants to write out a formula like that? Uh, so just uh, some stuff they did this in the, in the chapter as well. Uh, why we're doing some normalization? 
uh, there's going to be some model, uh, some models that really depend on that, like PCA, they depend on uh, the, all the variables being on the same scale. Uh, so we're going to explore that a little bit. Uh, so there's a bunch of recipes here. And this is where in the book, they're like, oh, use this uh, parsnip uh, model specifications kind of uh, deal, which actually, I mean, yeah, it's pretty helpful. Like, so I can click on, oh, I want to try all these different uh, model frameworks, all right? And then click this and it, in, the, in my window, it prints out, you know, built out code for that and even suggested parameters uh, that you might want to tune for that. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, super helpful. Uh, that was even something John asked us to cover in the learning objectives. Um, I think that is uh, something worth covering. Uh, that could be, I don't know, I haven't used it yet, but I do plan on doing that. This yeah, is I thought amazing. It, yeah, the one thing that drove me crazy playing around with it is the match on regex. If you put something in there, it unselects everything that you that doesn't match, which is awful. So, um, or maybe it's only if you actually use it. So if you know if you select ranger there, whatever, and now clear out the regex, and it doesn't have it anymore. And I just thought that was really annoying because I was trying to go through and find all the ones I want to use. And then, mm. yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, that's a yeah. pretty useful thing. Um, so yeah, I, I put this in its own details block. I don't know why, like the little arrow here is not showing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, but yeah, that's a lot of code. I was like, I don't want to show all that. Um, so now we do the cool stuff, the workflow sets, right? So we've created a couple specifications here. Um, I do my own naming format. I prefer to put spec at the beginning of the variable name, another way that I'm weird. Um, they also like started like capitalizing some of these. Uh, yeah. I was like, what is going on here? What, what are you doing, Max or Julia? You know, just keep it simple, silly. Uh, so I definitely did that different here. Just everything snake case. Um, but. Uh, so here we're using the normalized recipe for those specific model frameworks where it's helpful, like specifically SVM and KNN. Here, the difference uh, between the two SVM recipes is one is like has a radial kernel and the other has like, I think the is built on, uh, I forgot what, what we did differently. Oh, we use kernel. Oh, no, no, we're trying to, we're testing out different degrees uh, for uh, yes, the SVM RBF versus SV SVM poly. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so that is that. Let me close this again. Uh, so there was only three of those, and we have our preprocessor, so our recipe. Um, and we do this kind of naming convention, right, where we put what we want the suffix to be, or I think this is actually the prefix. Yeah, the prefix here to the workflow ID. And it combines basically our name here with our name here in the, in the list for models to create our workflow ID. I think there's like probably some customization you can do if it really bothers you or just like rename it yourself uh, if you want to. Uh, but yeah, that's what we do for our norm normalized recipe. Uh, there's a couple rest, uh, model frameworks we want to test out with the polynomial recipe, uh, our linear regression and our KNN uh, spec. So just two there. And it's basically, we talked about this before, it's doing a cross. Uh, so if we had like two recipes and two models, it would come up with four workflow sets. Um, and then there's some recipes where you don't want to do any pre-processing. And I actually didn't test this out, but like, I don't know if we have to have some pre-processing step. I think maybe we could pass like null into pre-proc or pre-proc here. But in the book, they show just do like a dummy kind of uh, pre-processing where we just, we create, like we use this workflow variables uh, function. And- I think you probably have to do that as a minimum just so it knows yeah. what's tagged as outcome and what's tagged as predictor. But doesn't that go in the specific, oh no, no. Uh, the recipe, we're not passing the recipe here so it wouldn't know. Right. Okay. So I think that's like just the minimum info that it can use for for fitting and you probably could do it as a formula instead of as variables um i don't know no yeah. i need to play 
Yeah, I just followed their format. It was pretty simple and straightforward. I, I understood why they were doing it like that. Uh -huh. But uh, anyways, there's a couple of our specs that we have that don't need pre-processing, in particular, basically all the tree-based ones. This cubist one, you know, I'm not super, super familiar with that. Uh, Mars, which is like what adaptive splines, uh, where it, it also has like, does it have like built-in like rec like recursive partitioning of like features? Like, so it can almost like subset your features for you. I don't remember exactly how Mars works, um, but it's kind of a cool framework where it's, uh, you, you can just throw stuff at it and it'll, it just works. <laughs> kind of like a lot of our, you know, random forces and our, and our, our gradient boosting stuff. Uh, so it's it's kind of a cool one. I honestly haven't used it before, but it seems cool in theory. Uh, so yeah, so we now have a couple of workflow sets variables, the sets norm, the sets polynomial, and the, set, the sets simple with the no preprocessing. Um, and we can just bind them all together. And in the book they showed, I think this was just illustrative to show, oh yeah, you can modify, you can just do your normal deploy or mutate uh, and remove like the simple prefix on at least these uh, these simple workflow IDs, um, just to show that these aren't like super special things. I mean, they are special, but like you can modify these in your data frame just like anything else, like they're like any other value. Uh, so yeah, uh, we built up our workflow set data frame or Tibble with 11 different workflow sets we're trying out here. Um, and then we do the thing. Um, where we just do workflow map. And we kind of, this looks a lot, uh, pretty similar to like, if you use tune grid, uh, you create your control grid, you know, say, okay, how do you want to parallelize your work? If you want to save your workflow or not, if you want to save your predictions or not. Uh, and then, yeah, instead of like tune grid, uh, you do workflow map uh, and it just works. Um, I guess the one thing I'm curious about here is like how you would do this if you wanted to specify different grids for like each of these workflow sets. Like here you're just saying, okay, uh, you know, tune, uh, give me five random parameter sets for each of these uh, workflow sets. But is it possible to like have like, I don't know, use grid max entropy to come up with like tuning parameters uh, separately for each of your workflow sets? I don't know, that's something I'd have to experiment with. But um, anyways, mm -hmm. this is pretty convenient. I know, like, at least from, because it is a data frame, right? Like, you could write your own, like, custom map function to control that. Because um, I'm assuming workflow map literally sits on top of the map function and just has, like, a couple extra bells and whistles there. Um, but that could be an option. Yeah, I, I imagine that you could customize it like that, right? There's probably some dot, dot, dots that you can yeah. work through. Uh, and this took, even with that small data set, you know, took it forever for this to run. Uh, I think it was, actually, it was only like 20 minutes. So it wasn't that bad. Uh, so I, found a, I found a bug to fix. Oh. <laughs> There's a typo in uh, workflow map, because I was trying to see how workflow map works, just in an error message. Anyway. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so they showed this, I think they, they showed this in the chapter, but didn't really point it out, like uh, how many models they ran when they did this. Like, so you, I assigned everything to this variable res grid, ran collect metrics like normal, um, and just said, okay, how many models were there? So 4,800 models, you know, we started with 11 workflow sets. Uh, I don't want to do all the math on that, but I think that's, a, <laughs> I think that checks out with 11 workflow sets, you know, five, um, five as our grid parameter, I don't know, but there's a lot. <laughs> so you're inevitably gonna end up with a, at least one pretty good model or one good parameter set here. Uh, so yeah, I go forward with that. I think one thing I found that was weird is I can't, I couldn't go forward with this cart bag uh, workflow ID because it's like a resample object instead of like a tune object. And in the book, they seem to just like keep going straight forward with that. But first, like, I don't know, if I try to run workflow rank results, it just wouldn't work for me because only because of that cart bag object uh, being of like our sample type. And uh, so we, if you, if I remember correctly, something 
we use fit resamples to create like an R sample type if there's like really no hyperparameters to tune. And otherwise it becomes like a tune object. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know how they did that in the book <laughs> where they just were able to move forward with this cart bag uh, workflow set in there and its submodels um, because moving on, just calling workflow sets rank results did not work for me. Hmm. Um, but yeah, anyways, going forward, uh, you run rank results. And I guess another thing I thought was weird here is like it keeps both your RMSE and R squared uh, metrics. Uh, so when we ran collect metrics, I guess I should have printed this out. It uh, it calculates both R squared and RSME or RMSE for each of those model uh, models. Uh, but when you rank, do rank results, I guess my intuition is like, oh, it's just going to keep the RMSE uh, models. But uh, it ends up like ranking both the RMSE and R squared, but ranking the R squared according to RMSE. Uh, so it was just like a little confusing to me. So I was like, let me just drop R squared since I'm not going to be looking at that. Um, did a, you know, a little bit more post-processing, took like what's the best model of each model type to come up with uh, nine model sets. So we started with 11 workflow sets, but we dropped the cart bag. Uh, and we think, well, what else did we drop here? I think I dropped well, actually boost. I don't know why that didn't show here. I dropped the XG boost one because it was, no, it's, it's here. It just had a, like a really bad rank. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I wasn't going to plot that. So um, anyways, I took basically these values and made a plot of it. Uh, and wow, that got cut off there. Uh, it's kind of strange to me, but the normalized SVM ended up having the best RMSE or the lowest RMSE. Uh, the XG boost had like the worst. And that's, I think, just because we didn't really fine tune the parameters. We were trying to tune over like five or six hyperparameters. But it only allowed it like five different options. So they're like uh, inevitably, it's like basically having random hyperparameters, which, you know, it's not that good of a model framework. You got to actually tune the hyperparameters for it to work. Um, whereas, you know, the SVM approach seemed to work without doing a lot of uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. I think there's an auto plot function for this that they show in the book. It's just like it was really hard for me to read. And it like plotted like the model, it plotted by model instead of like workflow ID. So it had like the different names than the, the names that I had assigned with workflow ID. And I was like, I don't want to use their, I don't, I mean, I don't want to use their generic names, especially if you have like multiple types of boost tree, it becomes kind of confusing because the only way to differentiate them is like the type of pre-processing that the, you did. And you might've done two boost trees, one without pre-processing and another with the pre-processing. So the auto plot, it plots it by, I mean, let me just pull this up. Um, it plots the pre-processing by like shape and it's like just so hard to see. Like it like splits out pre-processor pre uh, as a recipe or a workflow variable. And you can't really tell, one is a circle and one's a triangle. <laughs> I'm like, I can't tell because they, they plot the middle point in this as like a triangle or a circle. And I was like, I don't like that auto plot function. So I basically took their auto plot code made my own version of it. So just a heads up if you're using that. It's very convenient, obviously, right? The auto plot stuff. Uh, in fact, I do use the auto plots uh, to plot specifically uh, the norm, uh, their normalized SVM polynomial um, model. I plot all its submodels. And we only made five submodels for each of these. So there's only five points here. Um, again, the auto plot was, you know, I still don't really like it. In fact, when I put a meme here, how I feel using autoplot every time, it just like it feels like magic. I'm like, I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but hopefully it looks okay. In this case, it, it was I was okay with it. Like the points should be larger. Maybe like I don't know. I feel like the good data is is like you need it. <laughs> like I can hardly see the points even on this you know, with just the five points. Um, but in this case, I was like, oh, I can see at least I can see the, each submodel. So some of these like this. Uh, you know, model with the cost log two uh, right here had the lowest RSME or RMSE and the one with uh, two degrees um, for its polynomial terms um, ended up having the lowest RMSE. So it's a good way to like really drill down to see how one submodel compared to the rest of the submodels, uh, you know, for one of the given model frameworks or workflow sets. 
Yeah, and I don't go over the Tune Ray Sonova. Um, it's pretty similar in, in the book. They show that they ended up coming towards like similar conclusions with it. Uh, yeah, they plotted, you know, like a, their grid of racing RMSE versus grid of just like their complete grid, like our approach basically, um, and came up with a pretty correlated results there. So I guess if you're really um, needing to save time, you can do the racing approach, which in this case, you really, this really could be viable, right? You could be running like a hundred different grid options for like 10 different models. And in that case, with a large data set, that could take days, even if you have pretty high computing power. So racing really could be pretty important there. Uh, and then the, the rest of this was pretty boring, honestly. It's like the same kind of uh, stuff we've seen in previous chapters where we take, okay, what's the best model? You pull out uh, the best workflow ID, I guess. Now that's our way of identifying a model uh, in this case. And then just uh, pull your workflow set results. I guess that's a, that's a new function uh, from the workflow set package, I think. Or I'd, I'd actually have to check. It might be from one of the other tiny models packages. Uh, but you use that to pull it out from your grid of workflow sets. And then you do, you know, pull workflow, finalize workflow, last fit. So the last fit will re, uh, choose your best parameters for you. Uh, oh, extract it from your finalized workflow and then pass in your train or your testing data set with the split object that we created before from where we, you know, we split from, you split the training and testing. Uh, so this is actually, yeah, it's pretty similar to if you were just using uh, just like tune grid. So that's really nice. It's like the same type of function, functions here. So going from our, you know, the approach we were using before workflow sets to workflow sets uh, is very similar. So it's like a uh, nice little learning curve or basically no learning curve. Um, Again, I'm just pulling out the metrics and plotting our predictions. We, I don't know. I feel like everyone's always got to do this, right? Plot the observed versus the predictor just to make sure that, you know, that it makes sense. Uh, and here I was very, I, I was uh, adamant about the small geom uh, points size. So I was like, okay, I got to make these big. And there's only, there's not that many points in the test set. I think it was like 30 or something. So it's like, Make sure we can see all the points here. And there is, yeah, one pretty big miss down here for the smaller, um, uh, what is it, ladder score that we're predicting. But you know, about everywhere else is pretty good. Uh, and that's all I had. Um, it's really just more about workflow sets, uh, how you can use this. I, I guess you would use this if you're, you know, doing rapid development and want to see what kind of like model framework works best for your data. Because uh, in a lot of cases, uh, tr you know, a booster tree or random forest may not be the best. Um, so there are a lot of times, especially with like classification where like an SVM approach can really work. Um, so that's where something like this could uh, really help. Like, I don't think you're going to be having this like in production, right? You're not going to be like retraining a model or going through all the workflow sets. I think you kind of do this offline, choose like the best model framework, and then maybe in production, you're like having tuning the parameters for like just one of those, like one of those model frameworks. Um, at least that's how I imagine uh, this would be used, but you really yeah. all that offline development process, right? This is, that's where this is really helpful. Yeah, I definitely would use this more for like the beginning of discovery, project. right? Yeah when you're trying to figure out what, okay, what the heck is going to work here? It's, it's really cool. I really like, you know, he, he screens 25,000 model and pre-processor combinations, I mm -hmm. think he said. So um, that's pretty cool. The painful way wish to do... Oh, go ahead, Connor. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I kind of wish this was earlier in the book. I know it was, it was written later, but like conceptually, this is more exploratory to me. That's, that's fair. Um, I know and that's part of why I wanted to go back and do this. I know there are um, new, uh, just little tidbits scattered before this about workflow sets. 
Um, well, I say scattered before it's like two or three chapters mention it. Um, so we missed some of the introduction to workflow sets. Um, and then this one is kind of like, you know, it's, it's taking grid search or iterative search um, where you're searching not over just parameters, but you're searching over just tons of different models and preprocessor combinations. So, um, yeah. and also the, you know, a grid search or you could do iterative search. So. Yeah. It just feels to me like in the, in the, in the R for data science book, like they use that flights set a whole bunch, right? And right. they don't they don't make you go through like the hard way. First. <laughs> yeah, they show you like here's the best way to do it. True. Yeah, and I if think you like, want to dive in and do the hard way later, you can. I, I think like to like really pull off this chapter though, you need like those preluding like um building blocks right like hey you have to know about tune you have to know about well what is parsnip you have to know what, about what model specification is like i really think this is kind of like the hey let's bring it back to like the no free lunch theorem because basically like hey there is no good model until you test out all models <laughs> um and that's what this that like to me that's what this chapter is um which i really really liked because like some projects that I was painfully doing this on is like, okay, well, I'll use the crossing function to like cross across a bunch of lists. And then I'll start using mapping functions to build up. Like I was using carrot at the time, but basically here's the carrot formula. Here's the tuning grid for each. And then that becomes a real, like this chapter is awesome for me. Like in terms of discovery, I love it. Yeah, I mean, th this seems like it really pulls everything together. It's like the B player of, of tidy models, almost. Yeah, I could see, I, I'm trying to think, like, this definitely has a lot of prereqs, but I could see it kind of the way they did in, um, in the new version of our packages. They do chapters where they do, like, everything, and then they walk through okay, but how do you actually do that? What are those pieces? So I could see it working really well to, to like show this without really explaining some of the pieces. And they do the same thing in R4DS actually, where they'll show, you know, like they do the ggplot chapter first, basically. And mm. then they walk through how to like select things or whatever. So I could see. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a that. different like yeah. perspective or, or like principle, but like whether you if you're teaching, are you supposed to teach how to how to work with lists and vectors first, or do you skip to tables and group by and summarize? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, we're having like a meta conversation. We're not yeah. even talking about the chapter at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I I did love for, for more um, extremely meta conversation that I love that you did the advanced R uh, meta programming within this. Um, I think that is, it's good to have that, uh, in your tool belt. Yeah. Bang, bang no, operator. Uh, yep. <laughs> By the way, I didn't know about this tune chord observe cred. I actually don't know exactly what that's doing, but that's the, Oh, it's, it's awesome. I, I use it like almost every project now. Is bang, bang getting deprecated? I think it is right. They're going it's with not the, deprecated. The, bracket bracket whatever it's you within a function you used to have to bang bang in sim and now yeah. bracket bracket is bang bang and in sim but neither of those is going away oh, okay aren't there some cases where the uh brackets don't work and that's when you have to lean go back towards uh two well to sim and bang bang yeah like here you don't you don't yeah, want you could, to in could, sim so it's old style for me, but yeah. I think you could you could do the brackets. You probably uh, could uh, bracket bracket call y instead of call y sim. I, Try honestly, both and see which one works, and then be like, yeah. all right, I guess this is the one I'm using for this function. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I never really hated the because if you do if you work if you're okay with working with character vectors and convert to symbols uh, instead of like working with close and end close and just use bang bang, uh, 
it it makes sense to me if you if you do everything with symbols but i think everything can be converted to symbols so it was like me like trying to learn the like the minimum knowledge that will you know get me the you know the farthest along the way and i never really had troubles with it um obviously it was a hard concept to like wrap my mind around originally uh but it eventually made sense uh, I don't know. Hot take there. Hot take. Sorry. <laughs> if you if you've ever worked with like pointers, right, in like lower level languages, like I don't know, like Java or C plus plus, I don't know. It always it felt a little bit like that, and maybe it's like why I was okay. Yeah, why I was okay with the idea of sims <laughs> and bang bang, but I don't know. Yep. <laughs> I will not be posting that opinion on Twitter. Uh, do not want to be canceled. Sorry. Uh, this is a safe space. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Bang Bang. I like, I like saying it. It's fun. <laughs> bracket bracket just does not have the same impact. <laughs> What's what, what was it? Embrace. I think that's what they're saying. You have to embrace, embrace. your variables. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does look slick when it works, all right? Like yeah. in a defier group by or something. Uh, okay, yeah, that's yeah. all I had uh, for the chapter. It's very cool. I like this chapter. Um, I like this this uh, package. I think it's going to be useful. I haven't actually, like, for real used it yet, but um, it's interesting. I might try this in sliced. <laughs> Actually, this would take too long, honestly, <laughs> to run. Did they just add this chapter? Because I, I feel like I didn't see it like two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, I think it was there two weeks ago, but I don't think it was there a month ago. It was somewhere in that range. Um, definitely recent. Um, like, we were going to do a review of 10 through 14, this week and then it's like oh there's a 15 and then they added all the names of the new chapters but they haven't added any content yet i don't think they've done any actual writing on them yet um so i have like some boilerplate code code at work where i've like started using like tidy models and like transitioning from carrot and then basically i was doing it like the old painful like trying to do this but the old painful way where you're like okay i'm gonna like do a bunch of nested tibbles. We're going to do crossing. We're going to like do a bunch of map functions to add step. It becomes very like wordy. Whereas this is like workflow sets. All right. Well, that was great. <laughs> I feel like this is similar to like pipelines and SK learn. Uh, trying to find like the example, of it. but yeah, like they have a preprocessor and stuff. It's just pretty good. preprocessor and like the model and well I know it can do crossing as well but that's what this really reminded me of anyways I, sorry for bringing up Python <laughs> <laughs> there's no hate here um, All right, so uh, what's next now yeah so I think let's go ahead and plan to do a review of these uh, six chapters next week. I'll lead that, but kind of the idea is we'll be working out what kinds of things would we like to ask uh, Max and or Julia if we talk to them again. And then we'll talk to them again, probably. Um, and then I think pause, because the chapters are coming soon, but they're we're ahead of them. There's... There's lots of books. Like we could go do the feature engineering book. I'm I am interested in that, but I'm getting requests for other things, and there are things that I want to do. So I'm going to go do those. <laughs> uh, you're not a thousand percent in. <laughs> I'm a thousand percent in on the tidy text. I yeah I I, I have skimmed it. I have like used it used the index, but I've never read it cover to cover. Um. So that'll be a good one, I think. Aren't uh, like Julia and Emil writing like a, I don't know, a 
uh, language or I don't know, uh, NLP type of version of tidy modeling with R? Yes. Um, what is that one? I've got it. That one is like after tidy text. <laughs> um, where is the chapter? Uh, and I talked to uh, Emil about which way to go. Where is this? So yeah, SL, SML TAR, Supervised Machine Learning for Text Analysis in R is their new book and like set of, probably set of packages coming, um, which actually just, uh, they just finished. So yeah, like updated two days ago. Um, so we'll be doing that book at some point too, but it, uh, it's not, it doesn't replace tidy text. It's just like more advanced techniques on top of tidy text. Yep. S-M-L-T-R? Did I say that wrong? Yes. S-M-L-T-A-R. A-R. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> took a look at this before. It looked pretty tight. Yeah. yeah. It was funny. I was talking to um, uh, I don't know what his actual name is, but Shem Sedin. Uh, he was asking about tidy text and S-M-L- uh, T-A-R and we were talking about which one to do and while we were talking they updated the book and so we're like oh okay I think they're actively working on that one maybe we uh, should give them a minute before we read it um. yeah I don't know I got I somehow got linked to this byte, byte pair encoding page the other day hmm. I was like wow I didn't even know this book existed yeah, it's brand new, publishing this fall, I think, something like that. Um, I mean, not that that ever stops us, but. Uh, Ooh, they have a line here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, featured explanations. Okay, <laughs> I'm excited. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm. Alex I'm looking is an awesome sure. package too. Yeah. How did it like how how did they never stop working? Like this book is like fully panned out already. Well, I'm sure there's they could still be working on it, but well, I'm pretty sure like he said that this one just went to the publisher. Um oh. so probably uh Julia will be working on um tidy models more now because she finished this book. That that's my hope at least. This is how I browse the internet, by the way. I just like click through links. I'm like, okay, store this in the back of my mind here. <laughs> it's the muscle memory for when you need to Google it later. Right. Ah. Exactly. Well, and also Google memory. Yeah. <laughs> it's a purple link. Never clean yep. up the history. <laughs> okay. So John, I guess you're gonna so you're gonna like try to look at the Git history and be like, okay, here's the stuff that's changed. Yeah, there was one PR that was all of the workflow set stuff. And so it's not that hard to find. Um, I looked at it a couple of times already. I talked about it a little bit um, a few weeks ago, but uh, there is some stuff that we, that had, you know, had already introduced it. So we'll talk about that a little bit and then just general, you know, um, start gathering questions and comments that we'll have. And then we'll get um, probably both of them. We'll see. Uh, into talk and then yeah then then we'll pause and let them catch up um unless they surprise me and, ch and publish chapter 16 in between um yeah you can always go back and do that ai ethics chapter i don't know that. yeah actually that that might be worthwhile too that was something that i think cohort two um added and thought it was a cool idea so I don't know what's going on with my org markdown. Yeah, actually, it looks like it's um, like we're missing the arrow on our deployed version in um, whatever in the drawers. So yeah, so yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, the AI ethics um, we can bring that in as well. 
because yep. it would be great. I, like I like this book, and I I really quite want to read the like the titles sound good. Um, encoding categorical data, dimensionality reduction, explaining models and predictions. When should you trust predictions? Ensemble models and inferential analysis. Like all of those sound like useful chapters. Um, but they're they don't have any text. They don't have they don't have anything any draft versions because I look at the PRs every once in a while and there's nothing. So they're baiting us. They're, they yeah. should be like a you should write the movie titles or book titles. They're they're doing a good job. <laughs> Blue Harvest for Star Wars or whatever yeah. it was back in the day. Indeed. Okay. All right. Anyone have anything else? If not, thanks, Tony. All right. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Thanks, Tony. Very cool. Thank you very much. See, See you all yes. next week. Bye.